In this video, we're computing the integral of x cubed times the square root of r squared minus x squared from 0 to r, where r is a constant. And this is a classic trigonometric substitution type of form that we're looking at here. This r squared minus x squared piece can be simplified into a single term by using the trig substitution, let x be equal to r sine theta. And the whole point of that substitution is that then inside the square root, we'll have an r squared minus r squared sine theta. And when we factor the r squared out of that, we get 1 minus sine squared theta, which is cosine squared theta. So there are a lot of details to deal with along the way. If x is r sine theta, then we also have to transform the differential dx. So that's going to be r cosine theta d theta. I'm also going to go ahead and transform the limits of integration from x to theta space. So we look at what it means for theta when x is equal to 0. If x is equal to 0, I get 0 equals r sine theta, and that means sine theta is 0, and this happens when theta is equal to 0. When I look at the upper limit, x is equal to r, that means r is equal to r sine theta. Dividing by r, I find out that the sine of theta is equal to 1, which happens when theta is equal to pi over 2. So now I can transform my entire integral in terms of theta. I still have a lower limit of 0, but now my upper limit is a theta limit, and that upper limit is pi over 2. Now my x cubed has to be replaced in terms of theta, and x is r sine theta, so I have r sine theta all raised to the third power, and then I have the square root of r squared minus r squared sine squared theta. Again, that is designed to take advantage of the Pythagorean identity. 1 minus sine squared theta is equal to cosine squared theta. And don't forget to transform this differential dx. That transforms to r cosine theta d theta. Now we're going to end up with a lot of factors of r out of this. In this first term, I have an r cubed that I can pull out. In my square root, I have an r squared that can factor out of the interior, but that becomes an r when I pull it out of the square root. So there's a fourth factor of r. And then I have a fifth factor of r sitting in this differential term. So I'm just going to move the r to the fifth out in front of the whole thing. And we have r to the fifth integral from 0 to pi over 2. And then I have a sine cubed theta. And in my square root, I have a 1 minus sine squared theta, which is cosine squared theta. And when I take the square root, I just get cosine of theta. So again, we already took care of the r part of this, but this is also going to produce a cosine theta. So we put that together with the cosine theta at the end of the integral, and I end up with cosine squared theta. And this is a reminder of why we study trigonometric integrals before we talk about trig substitutions, and it's because they often result in these classic trigonometric integrals. So I have an odd power of the sine function sitting next to an even power of the cosine function, and I'm trying to think of something productive to do with this. And the key to the problem is to realize that if I have the sine of theta sitting next to a bunch of cosine containing terms, that takes care of setting up the chain rule backwards. So what I'm going to do is split off a sine squared from this sine cubed and then write it in terms of cosine. So here I have r to the fifth integral from 0 to pi over 2. And again, the point is to end up with a single isolated factor of sine theta because that's the derivative of cosine. And I split off a sine squared to get this done, but sine squared can be replaced with 1 minus cosine squared. All right, so this whole piece right here started at sine cubed theta, and then we have the cosine squared theta term left over and our differential d theta. So now I'm going to distribute the cosine squared into these parentheses, and I end up with sine of theta multiplying cosine squared theta minus cosine to the fourth theta d theta. And again, the whole point of this is I wanted to set it up so I can see the chain roll backwards. And that means looking for like a power of a function, so a power of cosine sitting right next to the derivative of that interior function. One adjustment that will make things a little bit easier on us here is to realize the derivative of the interior function is actually negative sine theta. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we can multiply the inside of our integral by negative 1 as long as we compensate out in front with a minus sign. And if you want to do formal u substitutions at this point, what you would do is let u equal cosine theta, but it's just not necessary because we're so close to seeing the chain rule here. When I have the derivative of the interior function, I can just apply the power rule to each of these. So I end up in the first term with a one-third cosine cubed theta, and in the second term, a one-fifth cosine to the fifth theta. Now this is all evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. And just to linger on this chain rule backwards issue for just a second, if I imagine taking the derivative of this first term, one-third cosine cubed theta, 
you differentiate with respect to the interior function. So you bring down to three, canceling that one third, and you would end up with cosine squared theta. But then the chain rule says you have to multiply by the derivative of cosine, which was tacked right onto that term as a negative sine theta. So we're just seeing that process backwards by looking for that derivative of the interior function, which was negative sine theta in our case. Okay, subbing in our upper limit, we're going to end up with these powers of cosine pi over two, but cosine pi over two is zero. So both terms are gone there. And then I subtract what happens when I sub in zero for theta. Well, if I'm subtracting, then this minus sign out in front is gone because I'm subtracting that whole term. So I have a positive r to the fifth. And then my first term gives me one third cosine of zero cubed. Well, the cosine of zero is one. So I just end up with one third. Similar in the second term, I end up with negative one fifth. And now I have one third minus one fifth, and that's five fifteenths minus three fifteenths, which leaves me with two fifteenths. So I have two fifteenths r to the fifth. Now I want to point out that this integral actually came from solving a real physical problem. It was actually part of finding the moment of inertia of a solid sphere by breaking it into thin cylindrical shells. And I'll post a link to that full video of the moment of inertia integral at the upper left. This is a good reminder that trigonometric substitution has a lot of real physical applications. And it's a common way that you'll find yourself using calculus 2 in the context of physics and engineering. Thanks for watching.